Welcome online family, we're glad you're here. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you won't miss out on any of our content. Also, head over to the App Store and download our TFBC app where you can check out all of our events. You can leave prayer requests for us. You can also follow our sermon notes as we give the message each week. Speaking of messages, we got a great one for you today. So let's dive right in. And good morning again. I want to greet those who are watching online and as we continue in our series, uh, Twists and Turns. And basically, for those of you who are involved in Vacation Bible School, you're familiar with some of these texts that we're focusing on. We're simply taking the lessons that were part of those uh, children's Bible stories throughout the Vacation Bible School week and particularly focuses on the life of Peter and all the twists and turns in his life as he seeks to follow Jesus. And I must say that uh, God in his infinite wisdom uh, was certainly in this because um, as I have prepared for these messages and been drawn to passages that I probably would not have gone to without the, the fact that they were kind of assigned, if you will, in this twist and turn series, uh, it has been a, a, a good time for me just to spend time with the Lord and have him speak to me and minister to my heart. We talked last week about the storms and that there are purposes in the storm. Certainly they help us discover our need for God. They help us to begin to see God revealed in miraculous ways, ways we don't expect, new ways. Certainly that was the case for Peter and the disciples out on the boat. And Jesus sent them out to cross the Sea of Galilee to go to the other side, the mission field that was represented on the other side. That God wants to help us do the impossible things that we cannot do, things that he must empower us to do. And certainly to help us overcome fear uh, with faith as we learn to take a step of faith and trust God. And this morning's passage has uh, certainly been, I don't know when I've encountered a passage that was more poignant and real for me in terms of how God is speaking to me. In this particular passage about receiving forgiveness and another chance. Receiving forgiveness And another chance. As we focus in on the life of Peter in this particular passage, we find that he is a broken man and he is struggling to find his way. He finds himself boxed in in this room, this tomb, we might even say, of fear and frustration, fretting and failure. He has denied his Lord. He has boldly come out and said, Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere, and encountered Jesus saying to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. He felt in that moment that could not be possible. Somehow he felt that he was stronger than he actually was, that he could overcome things that he was not able to, and he found himself in a place where again and again, three times, he denied even knowing the Lord. He goes through the experience of hearing the rooster crow. And then we're told in Scripture, he wept bitterly, acknowledging that he had failed, acknowledging that he was not as strong as he thought he was, and acknowledging in that moment the fear that had overcome him. He has gotten to a place where I think it's safe to say he has lost his first love. 
And it's into that situation that Jesus moves and speaks. And it's a word that I think for all of us, for every follower of Christ, what we have here is a good example, a model of what it looks like to be restored, what it looks like to receive forgiveness and another chance. And I'm mindful that last week we talked about how comforting it is or should be encouraging to us that when the disciples are in the storm, Jesus is praying for them. And in particular, Luke 22 tells us about a specific time when Jesus speaks to Simon. In Luke 22, verse 31, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat. Certainly not just Peter, all of them. But Jesus says, I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, that you will strengthen the brothers. Now, there's so much in that. Not only is Jesus reminding, reminding us again that he's praying for us, certainly praying specifically for Peter in this time in his life, but acknowledging the spiritual warfare and the fact that the enemy is asking to sift him, to, to basically put him through a difficult time. And Jesus is praying for him that when he turns back, he picks us up, turns us around. When he turns back, meaning he's going to fail. Jesus knew he was going to fail, and he's praying for him that in some way he would find his way and be turned around in such a way that he would be able to strengthen the brothers. As we look at this message on receiving forgiveness and another chance, we primarily focus on John chapter 21. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to, to turn there. It's an interesting story, often referred to as the epilogue. If you read the last couple of verses of chapter 20, you can tell John basically wrapped up his gospel in chapter 20. So what's chapter 21 all about? Well, obviously there was some questions that were still lingering in the early church, John's gospel being, uh, we believe, the gospel that was written the latest. And some of these lingering questions... It seems pretty clear that John returns, picks up the pen, and adds another chapter, an epilogue as we often refer to it, to his gospel, addressing some of the questions that are obviously on the minds of folks in the church. And one of those questions certainly must have centered around Peter. <laughs> what happened to Peter? Last we heard, he had denied Jesus. He was weeping bitterly. He was a failure. What happened to Peter? And it's a question we can understand, especially in light of the early church. If you know the book of Acts, you know that it was on the day of Pentecost, filled with the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. Peter stands up, preaches a message, and over 3,000 come into the church. Clearly, the early church was aware of the leadership of Peter. So the question becomes, how did Peter get from there, the failure, to over here, where he's this powerful leader. If you read in the book of Acts, you'll see again and again, story after story of Peter doing incredible things. How did he get there? Well, he received forgiveness and another chance. And in the 21st chapter of John's Gospel is where we really see the picture play out. Now let me kind of set things up just a little bit because the message this morning, the point you'll see there, the first point, receiving forgiveness, enables us, empowers us to move from a place of failing faith and feeling like a failure. And that's where the story starts for Peter, at least as we pick it up in John 21. And there's some things in the reading of those first 14 verses we might quickly overlook or not be aware of the significance First of all, if you read in Matthew's gospel, the 28th chapter, it becomes clear that Jesus, when he appears to the disciples, it's where we get the great commission, Matthew 28, he gives the mission to the church, what they are to do, and he tells them to go to Galilee and that he will meet them there. And then later in verse 16 and 17 of that same chapter, we find that not only is he saying Galilee, but a specific mountain in Galilee. And Matthew tells us that when Jesus got there, some worshipped him, but some doubted. 
And I just got to tell you, I never really thought that it could be possible that the some doubted could be a reference to possibly Peter. That, that Peter is, in fact, quite possibly one of the ones who doubted. Caught up in his own fear, his own failure, his fretting and frustration. Is it possible that someone like Peter falls in the category of some doubted? It's possible because John seems to suggest to us, as we pick up the 21st chapter of John's gospel, that Peter is not where he's supposed to be. Let me read for you a couple verses in chapter 1. We're told afterward, we don't know exactly when this occurred, but sometime between the eighth day after the resurrection of Christ and the 40th day when he ascended into heaven. So somewhere between the eighth day and the 40th day, John tells us this occurred. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples, but notice where they are by the Sea of Galilee. Now, they are in Galilee. We could say, okay, so he's close. He, he's in Galilee, but he's not, he's not at the mountain. And we're told it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, which means twin, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, two other disciples. Well, if you do the math there, you find out there's seven now, we know Judas is already out of the picture, so there's 11 disciples, and four of them are not here. <laughs> and so it begs the question, where's the other four? And I would like to think the other four are in the mountain, right? They're up in the mountain where Jesus said, you're supposed to be. But Peter, clearly being a leader is not up in the mountain. He, we're told in verse 3, says, I'm going out to fish. I'm going out to fish. He told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Now, it becomes significant as we start getting a sense of the failure and the frustration Peter finds himself in. Evidently, he may have went to the mountain, got, where's Jesus? He said he was going to show up. I don't know, but I'm going fishing. At some point, it seems that Peter concludes, I'm just not cut out to be a fisher of men. I don't know how to do it. I tried, and I failed. I denied Jesus. I can't do it. And self-doubt and self-pity seems to take over. And it's as if he's saying, I just want to go fishing. I, I want to go do something I know how to do. I want to go do something I can have some success in. That I can look at and be able to say, yes, I did something positive. And so he goes fishing. And he finds in that boat as he returns and what's implied here is not that he's just going fishing for the day what's implied here is he is making a career change he is saying i'm going back to my old life before jesus ever called me i'm going back to do what i know how to do i'm gonna fish and he caught nothing and i think john wants us to know as kindly as he can put it that Peter is in a place of disobedience, and his disobedience is resulting in failure and a loss of fellowship with Jesus. I say that because if you read in the passage, when Jesus shows up there at the sea, he calls out to them. Now, he had to yell, I'm sure, and obviously being Jesus, he can make it happen, but we're told the, the boat is some 100 yards out that's not, you're just not going to talk in a normal voice. If they're going to hear you from a hundred yards away, think about a football field, you're going to have to yell pretty loud. And when Jesus shows up, John tells us that he says to them, now a lot of the translations will say friends. The actual Greek here 
is, is a little colder than that. It's actually more like a, 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 something you would say to a stranger, someone you didn't know. Like, like maybe, guys! <laughs> and it conveys the idea that somehow their relationship is not where it should be. Now, having been blessed to travel in that part of the world, I, I can tell you that some beautiful sights is when you go up into the mountains around the Sea of Galilee and you look down at the sea, this massive lake. And my hunch is that when Jesus got to the mountain, he possibly found four disciples and a view that he looked down in the Sea of Galilee and he saw them fishing in the sea. He has an awareness. You, you are not where you're supposed to be, Peter. And as a leader, Peter, you have influenced others. You said, I'm going to return to this, and others have just followed you. And so Jesus appears down by the water, yells out to them, hey, guys, have you caught anything? <laughs> And they say, no. Again, reminding us of the failure, the frustration. No, we haven't got a thing. Peter, in essence, saying, I'm going to go back to what I know. He goes back to what he knows, and he doesn't catch anything. Fishes all night, nothing. And Jesus says, cast your nets on the other side of the boat. Now, if you've been with us through this series, you know it, it should seem like, wait, we've been there before, right? That, that was a part of the commissioning of Peter when he first became a fisher of men. You, you recall the story. Jesus had him push out in deep water. He said, drop the nets. They said, we've been fishing all night, caught nothing. It's as if Peter's saying, look, Jesus, I know you're a rabbi, you're a teacher, you know a lot of things, but obviously I know a little bit more about fishing than you do. There's no reason to throw these nets out. There's no fish out here. If you recall the story, when they throw the, the nets out, they catch so many fish, it takes two boats to try to pull them in, and Peter, in his arrogance and pride, falls before Jesus and says, go away from me. I am not worthy. I'm a sinful man. To which Jesus calls and commissions him and says, you are to be a fisher of men. Leave these boats behind, which he did. We're told they walked away from everything. They left the boats, but they must have left them with some family members somehow because it appears as though in John 21, they have returned to those boats and those nets. And Peter's gone back to his old life. And Jesus shows up. How's the fishing, guys? Well, I've caught nothing. Why don't you throw the net on the other side? Now, I can imagine, some of you who fish, I can imagine Peter thinking, are you kidding me? I don't know who this guy is. See, they don't know who Jesus is yet. I, are you kidding me, right? Does he think we haven't tried to fish on the other side of the boat? Does he think the boat has just kind of stayed in this one place? Does he not understand we've been fishing these waters? There are no fish. Until he throws the net on that side. And all of a sudden, they catch 153 fish, good-sized fish. I'm sure we're told large fish. And in that moment, as soon as it happened, it is John who says to Peter, it is the Lord, and Peter's already jumping into the water, evidently swimming some 100 yards. And if you can picture with me, he gets to the place where the water's more shallow, and in that mud, in that mire, he's walking and now waiting, and he heads up on the shore. And Jesus is waiting for him. And as he comes out of that mud, soaking wet, we must be reminded he feels like a failure. His faith has failed him. And he has no idea what's about to happen. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I, can, I think the reason we like Peter so much, I can relate to Peter in so many ways. I know what it is to feel the brokenness. I know what it is to weep bitterly. I know what it is to have your faith fail you 
and you feel like a failure. And as he steps on the shore, he encounters Jesus. Now, Jesus has made breakfast. <laughs> and what's interesting about the breakfast is there's some fish and bread, we're told, on the coals. You know how Jesus makes breakfast? He says, breakfast, right? And just there it is. There's fish on the grill, some bread. And, and he invites them. I love this. He invites them to come and have breakfast. This is where we begin to understand that Peter's about to find hope and healing in a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's no longer some stranger, some guy out there on a boat fishing. He now recognizes his Lord has come to him. And in that moment, he had to realize, oh, man, I messed up again. I was not where I was supposed to be. But I love that in the story, Jesus doesn't reprimand him. He doesn't say, Peter, what are you doing down here? You know you were supposed to be up there. Why did, what are you doing, Peter? He doesn't say anything that would necessarily contribute to Peter feeling more like a failure. What he does say is, come, let's have some breakfast. And I love this part. He then says to Peter, go and get some of the fish that's in the net. And he puts those on the grill to be a part of their meal. Now, I love this part. Don't miss this. Because the beauty here is, do we think for a moment that Jesus needs the fish in that net to make breakfast? No. He's already put a few on the grill just by saying, fish. You know? He could have put as many fish on. He didn't need the ones that were in the net. So why does he ask for those? Because Jesus has invited us to participate with him in what he's doing. And we must never forget that in the life of the church and ministry and serving as we seek to follow. He invites us to make some kind of contribution. There's something we can bring to the table to feel as though we're a part. Just offering our, what little bit we have to offer. And for Peter here in the story, I think it's, I don't know if you've ever pictured him and the flannel graph uh, Sunday school lessons or whatever, but Peter clearly is a big man. We, we know, and this is where it really comes from that he's a big man because we're told that the, all the other, the six other guys are bringing the boat ashore with the net. And when Jesus says, go get the net and some of the fish, it's implied that Peter goes down here, grabs this net, pulls it ashore by himself. Now let's think about it. There's 153 fish in there. Uh, large fish, we're told. If they weigh two pounds a piece even, he's pulling somewhere around 300 plus pounds of wet net and, and fish jumping around, and he's pulling it on shore. He must have been a pretty good-sized fellow. And then he has breakfast with Jesus. And Jesus, it's implied, waits on them. It's as if he's their server must have hearkened Peter back to the time that Jesus was going to wash his feet. And he said, no, Lord, no. And now here he is sitting around a fire. The smell of a fire that must have reminded him of a fire that he stood around when a slave girl said, you were, you were with that Galilee. No, 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 he denied him. I wonder if the smell of the fire and the smoke, the charcoal, whatever, may have reminded him of his failure even as he sat down to have breakfast. He is moving from a place of failing faith and feeling like a failure to finding hope and a second chance in a relationship with Jesus, where Jesus is providing for his needs and engaging him in conversation. And it is what Jesus says that may be most significant. We're told that in verse 15, when they had finished eating, 
It's as if he didn't want to spoil the meal. He's like, go ahead and eat your fish and your bread. Get your fill. I'm going to address that, that need that you have for physical hunger. Go ahead and get you something to eat. And as soon as they had finished eating, he said, Simon, son of John. And we should say, ooh. <laughs> that might have stung a bit. If you know Peter's story, you know Simon is his name, Simon, son of John. That's who he was previously. Jesus gave him a new name, right? What name did Jesus give him? You are Peter, meaning rock. And upon this rock, he said, I'll build my church. You're Peter. You're, he gave him a new name. You're no longer Simon. That's your old name. You're now Peter. But in this moment... Why in the world would Jesus call him by his old name? There's no reference to Peter here at all. Simon, son of John. I think it's kind of like when my mom used to say, Robert David Cherry. You know, I mean, when she used my full name, have you ever, you, you, you kind of like, okay. <laughs> you notice that. I got to believe Peter noticed That Jesus called him by his own name. As if to say, if you're going to go back and live your old life, let's just call you by your old name. Have you forgot everything that we talked about, that, we, that I taught you? Are you just going to go back and be Simon, son of John, and fish? He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? more than these what are the these does he mean the other disciples that are there do you love me more than these guys i don't think so i think what's implied is he's referencing the boat the fish the nets do you love me more than this old life and all these things that were a part of your old life do you just want to go back to being simon the fisherman and as jesus begins to speak into the heart of Peter. Words of hope and healing. A second chance. He begins to focus Peter on the mission. His calling. His commissioning. Even takes him through experience of catching this huge fish, amount of fish, to remind him, you remember that day, Peter? You remember when I called you? You said, I'm not worthy, but I said to you, do not be afraid. I will make you fishers of men. You remember that day, Peter? We've just gone through something similar. He wants to focus him on the mission and what he's been called to do. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, you may have heard this if you've heard this passage preached, that he asked Peter that question three times. Evidently, because Peter denied him three times, he's going to give him three times, three opportunities to say he loves him. But what's also unique about this is the first two times, Jesus uses the Greek word agapeo, where we get the, the noun agape. It, it's a reference to the highest level of love. It's a, it's a reference to divine love, unconditional love. He's saying, Peter, or Simon, son of John, do you agapeo me do you love me in the highest level of love unconditional love and peter responds yes lord you know that i love you but peter uses the word phileo it, it's where we get philadelphia city of brotherly love it's a reference to brotherly love affection warmth friendship it's as if Peter is saying, there's no way in these circumstances when I've failed you, denied you, and disappointed you, I'm not going to dare say that I love you at the highest level. That should be obvious. I have failed. But I will say, I do love you. As a brother, as a friend, I love you. To which Jesus said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He points him to the mission. Again, he asked him, Lord, our Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, agapeo, 
to which Peter says, you know that I love you, phileo, I love you like a brother. Twice they say that. And then the third time, Jesus says, Simon, do you even phileo me? Do you even love me as a brother? Now that had to sting. (laughs) And we're told that Peter is hurt. Not just that he's asking for the third time, but because Jesus has now lowered the level of love. And he's asking, do you even love me in that way? Clearly, Peter has gotten so caught up in things that he has left his first love. And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus says for a third time, feed my sheep. I think it's significant, at least for me, it's been very convicting to think about the pronoun there. In pastoral ministry, it becomes clear in this conversation between Jesus and Peter that it's my sheep, Jesus' sheep. And he's saying to Peter, have you forgotten your calling? Have you forgotten your commission? Feed my sheep sheep and then he says to Peter something that at first glance might seem quite troubling he says Peter when when you were younger you dressed yourself you went where you wanted to go but when you are old you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go implying the sacrifice, the dying to self that will be a part of what it means to follow Jesus. That you reach a place in maturity in an older life as you mature in the faith, you realize that it's not about you and what you want, but it's about others. John tells us that Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. How many of you as a follower of Christ think it would be encouraging for Jesus to say to you, now when you were younger, I know you made a lot of the decisions for yourself, and it was about you, but as you mature into faith, as you get older, you're going to discover it's not going to be about you. In fact, what you're going to discover is, well, you're going to die. How many of you think that would be an encouraging word for Jesus to say to you? (laughs) When you're in a place of frustration and failure and he's like you're gonna you're gonna die and this is how you're gonna die and it would seem at first glance like why in the world would Jesus say that couldn't you just let that be a surprise to him but it's important that we not miss that what Jesus is saying to him is Peter you remember that night when I said I was gonna be crucified And you said, Lord, I will follow you all the way. I will even give my life for you. Remember when you said that, Peter? And I said to you, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And that's what happened. And that's what led you to this place of feeling like a failure. But Peter, I want you to know. I want to give you hope. I want you to know, Peter that when that time happens again, when you find yourself at a place where following me is going to cost you your life, Peter, I want you to know you're going to stand firm in the faith and you're going to die for the glory of God. He is giving Peter hope and confidence that God is not done with you. You're going to get a second chance, Peter, and you're going to glorify God. And I believe it was those words that caused him, enabled him, empowered him to stand up on the day of Pentecost and preach that powerful message because he no longer was gripped by fear. But there's one more thing in this passage that It haunts me. (laughs) 
And it's something I think for all of us we struggle with. When Jesus speaks to him in this conversation, he says to him, Peter, follow me. Not new words, he said that before, follow me. And if you get the picture, Peter evidently took a couple steps. I can see Jesus kind of turning and walking up toward the mountain. Let's go where you were supposed to be. And Peter, evidently, I can just imagine, he's taken a couple of steps, and then he turns. <laughs> and what's he do? He turns and he sees John. And he says, well, what about him? Friends, is that not one of the hardest things in following Jesus? That we want to look and ask about somebody else? Well, what about them? What are you going to do with them? What, what happens to them? In other words, if I've got to die, what happens to John? <laughs> is John going to have to die too? And Jesus says, basically, what happens to John is no business of yours. If I want him to live until I return, it's not... Your business, Peter. How many of you know sometimes we get so caught up in other people's business, worried about somebody else? What about them? What about them? And, and he, I can imagine that in that moment, Jesus is feeling pretty good. I, you weren't where you're supposed to be, Peter. I came down here. I met you. We had breakfast together. I've now called you. I've recommissioned you. I've given you a second chance. We're starting now. Follow me, okay? And he starts up, and they haven't taken two steps, <laughs> And Peter's already, what about him? And we get reminded of another thing in the early church. John's writing this. We can imagine the gossip. Gossip's always been a problem in the church. And in this particular gossipy story, evidently word spread that John was not going to die. <laughs> and John's saying, he's even trying to clear that up in this Epilogue, he's saying, Jesus didn't say I wasn't going to die. What he said was, if, if he wanted me to remain here until he returned. He's trying to clear up that gossip, that error that so often the enemy uses in the church. Follow me. And in this passage... I find God speaking to me. I find me relating so much to Peter and his efforts to follow. And in his best efforts, the reality of his failure, his failing faith, but the hope. of an encounter with Jesus, a relationship where Jesus speaks words that bring healing. Notice he doesn't say to Peter, you know what, I need to get you in some therapy, Peter, you know. We need to go through some kind of course, some workbook. He simply asked Peter one question three times. Do you love me? And we get reminded that that's really what it comes down to. How often we complicate things. I am grateful that as I prepare for this message, it's as if Jesus just showed up and asked me, do you love me? And it took me back to a little church in Garfield, Kentucky. An encounter as a 12-year-old boy who walked down an aisle and in essence was asked the same question, do you love Jesus? Do you believe he loves you? Do you want to have a relationship with Jesus? And I said, yes. <laughs> At best I knew how, I said, I love you, Jesus. And all of a sudden a journey began. A journey filled with twists and turns where you end up in places you never thought you'd be. And one of those places being feeling like a failure. 
frustrated. Saying, I can't do that. I just, I can't, I can't do it. Only to find a Savior who comes to where you are, even if it's not where you're supposed to be, (laughs) and meets with you. And says, I need you to answer this one question. Do you love me? My prayer is that I'm not the only one that God wants to speak through this passage to. And that God wants to remind all of us as we seek to follow him and as we navigate all kinds of twists and turns that the world will throw at us. For a people who know what it is, maybe try, try your hardest. I mean, we can honestly look at Peter's denials and we say, well, at least he was there, right? I mean, he was trying. Where are the others at? The problem is he was trying to do it in his own strength. And he would learn a painful lesson that he couldn't do it in his own strength. I got to tell you, that's been a painful lesson for me. And how often I've tried, maybe as you've been at ministry a while, you think, I got this thing figured out. I... I know how to do this. And you try to do things in your own strength and you fail. But praise God that Jesus doesn't leave you there. He comes to you and he asks that question, do you love me? I pray whatever circumstances you find yourself in, whatever the struggles are, that you are able to just go back to that place. Maybe when you first express love to God, return to that first love because it is so easy in this world to lose sight of that. That as you navigate the twists and turns, you somehow lose sight of Jesus and what it means to be in love with Jesus. I know for me, I'm grateful that he said to me, let's have some breakfast. Bobby, do you love me? Or have you forgotten what it means to be in love with me? And all the stuff you're trying to do Have you forgotten the relationship of love? Thanks for watching our Tulare First Baptist YouTube channel. But don't stop here. Hit the subscribe button so you won't miss out on any of our future videos. Also, don't forget about the TFBC app where you can stay connected because we'd sure love to see you on a Sunday morning or at any of our events. May God bless you and have a great day.